the brothers of Joseph go into Egypt to buy grain, unknowingly from the man they had sold into slavery. Will he seek revenge or reconciliation? <music> Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin. If you recall from the last episode, Joseph is in charge of all the food in Egypt. Because I'm your only hope. Ain't it the truth? In the next few chapters, we will hear the tale of how his brothers deal with Joseph and have to come to terms with their guilt. The story is filled with suspense, but also humor, as we begin to see the true colors of Joseph. As always, we'll look at this story from the lens of history, theology, and inspiration. And so, let us pray that the Lord will guide us as we read the sacred text. When Jacob learned that grain rations were available in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you keep gaping at one another? I hear, he went on, that rations of grain are available in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us, that we may stay alive rather than die of hunger. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy an emergency supply of grain from Egypt. It was only Joseph's full brother, Benjamin, that Jacob did not send with the rest, for he thought some disaster might befall him. Thus, since there was famine in the land of Canaan also, the sons of Israel were among those who came to procure rations. It was Joseph, as governor of the country, who dispensed the rations to all the people. When Joseph's brothers came and knelt down before him with their faces to the ground, he recognized them as soon as he saw them. But he concealed his own identity from them and spoke sternly to them. Where do you come from? He asked them. They answered, From the land of Canaan to procure food. When Joseph recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him, he was reminded of the dreams he had about them. He said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. No, my lord, they replied. On the contrary, your servants have come to procure food. All of us are sons of the same man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. But he answered them, Not so. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. In contrast to Joseph, the wise and discerning one, his brothers have no idea what to do once they realize they'd be running out of food. You can imagine them just standing around looking at each other, hoping that someone else will come up with a plan. What do we do now? And this is when their father Jacob scolds them and says, What are you doing standing around staring at each other? There's grain in Egypt. Off you go. But, of course, he does not let his baby Benjamin go with them, who, of course, would be in his 20s by now. But he's also the other son born to him by his beloved Rachel. And so he doesn't want to let him out of his sight. Although it would be unusual for Joseph, given his high rank, to be the one distributing grain at the border, he does meet his brothers there. It must have been divine providence that he was in the area at the time, probably checking on how everything was going. He immediately recognized them, but he himself must look completely different. He was only 17 when they last saw him. Now he's pushing 40 and appears as a clean-shaven Egyptian official. When they bow before Joseph, this must have unleashed a wave of emotions within him. It would not have only brought back his childhood dreams, as was mentioned, but everything else that was going on in his life during that time. The relationship with his father, his fancy tunic, his family, but also how his brothers turned on him. And so the conversation that follows at first seems like he's toying with them, accusing them of spying and looking at the weak points, or literally the nakedness of the land. Such an accusation can lead to imprisonment or even death based on Egyptian law. But Joseph uses this to instill fear in them. But what are his true intentions? Let's continue reading to find out. We, your servants, they said, were twelve brothers, sons of a certain man in Canaan. But the youngest one is at present with our father, and the other one is gone. It is just as I said, Joseph persisted. You are spies. This is how you shall be tested. Unless your youngest brother comes here, I swear by the life of Pharaoh that you shall not leave here. So send one of your number to get your brother, while the rest of you stay here under arrest. Thus shall your words be tested for their truth. If they are untrue, as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. With that, he locked them up in the guardhouse for three days. Now we can see why Joseph broke them with fear. He wanted to get information out of them without revealing his identity. And his brothers quickly give up that their father and younger brother are still alive in Canaan. And so now Joseph has what he wants to know about his family, and also, this gives him even more power over his brothers. So he continues to accuse them of being spies, and he throws them in prison for three days. No symbolism here, right? I wonder if Joseph even put them in the same prison that he was in for all those years. And while this may seem a bit vengeful, 
Joseph seems to be testing them and even preparing them for reconciliation. This theme will become more apparent as we continue with the story. Like God often does, he will allow them to suffer for a bit in order to appreciate the redemption that they seek. Three days was nothing compared to what Joseph endured, so this really wasn't an act of vengeance. In fact, this may have given his brothers a little bit of time to reflect and even discuss among themselves which brother they were going to send back to go fetch Benjamin. Of course, this also gave Joseph some time to think about what his next move would be. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you shall live, for I am a God-fearing man. If you have been honest, only one of your brothers need be confined in this prison, while the rest of you may go and take home provisions for your starving families. But you must come back to me with your youngest brother. Your words will thus be verified, and you will not die. To this they agreed. To one another, however, they said, Alas, we are being punished because of our brother. We saw the anguish of his heart when he pleaded with us, yet we paid no heed. That is why this anguish has now come upon us. Didn't I tell you, broke in Reuben, not to do wrong to the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. They did not know, of course, that Joseph understood what they said, since he spoke with them through an interpreter. But turning away from them, he wept. When he was able to speak to them again, he had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Then Joseph gave orders to have their containers filled with grain, their money replaced in each one's sack, and provisions given them for the journey. After this had been done for them, they loaded their donkeys with the rations and departed. These verses reveal a lot, and Joseph almost gives himself away. In fact, if his brothers were smart, they might have caught it. When he gives them the new plan, Joseph tells them, I am a God-fearing man. Now, while this could be referring to any God, including the Egyptian ones, because he uses the word Elohim, the expression itself is typically only used to speak of the God of Abraham. And this may also be a nod to the reader, showing us that Joseph has not lost his faith, and he continues to rely on the Lord. And so the new plan is that only one brother will be left behind, while all of the others can go back home to bring back Benjamin. I am altering the deal. It's actually an improvement in the original plan but they still have to return with their younger brother. But why does he choose Simeon to be left behind instead of Reuben, who would have been the firstborn and the one who would have responsibility over his brothers? Before we are told that he takes Simeon, we find out that Joseph had been speaking to them through an interpreter, which makes sense, not allowing them to hear his voice or even realize that he knows Hebrew gave him an advantage. It also allows him to eavesdrop on them. Not only does he hear them admit their guilt about what they did to him, their acknowledgement of sin. But also, Reuben speaks about how he tried to stop them. Remember, Reuben was also not present when Joseph was sold to the Ishmaelites. And so, instead of keeping the firstborn, Reuben, Joseph chooses the next, Simeon, holding him responsible for what his brothers did. The final detail is great, as we see the family wit come through in Joseph. In the sack of grains that they bought, he not only gives them provisions for the journey, but returns all of their money, right at the top of the bags, knowing that they would find them on their way home. And this does two things. One, it shows that he does still care about his family as he gives them the grain for free. But two, it messes with their heads, a real brotherly thing to do. For when they open up the bags, they think, we can't return to Egypt, we'll be accused of stealing on top of everything else. So let's see how they react. At the night encampment, when one of them opened his bag to give his donkey some fodder, he was surprised to see his money in the mouth of his bag. My money has been returned, he cried out to his brothers. Here it is in my bag. At that, their hearts sank. Trembling, they asked one another, What is this that God has done to us? When they got back to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. The man who was lord of the country, they said, spoke to us sternly and put us in custody as if we were spying on the land. But we said to him, We are honest men. We have never been spies. There were twelve of us brothers, sons of the same father, but one is gone, and the youngest one is at present with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man who is lord of the country said to us, This is how I shall know if you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, while the rest of you go home with rations for your starving families. When you come back to me with your youngest brother, and I know that you are honest men and not spies, I will restore your brother to you, and you may move about freely in the land. When they were emptying their sacks, there in each one's sack was his money bag. At the sight of their money bags, they and their father were dismayed. 
As expected, when they find the money bag, they are seized with fear. Of course, they believe that this is a punishment from God, showing that they're still feeling guilty about what they did to Joseph so many years ago. And so they finally return home and recount the whole story to Jacob, including the conditions that were put on them. So, how does Jacob react? Their father Jacob said to them, Must you make me childless? Joseph is gone, and Simeon is gone, and now you would take away Benjamin? Why must such things always happen to me? Then Reuben told his father, Put him in my care, and I will bring him back to you. You may kill my own two sons if I do not return him to you. But Jacob replied, My son shall not go down with you. Now that his full brother is dead, he is the only one left. If some disaster should befall him on the journey you must make, you would send my white head down to the netherworld in grief. As expected, Jacob is not pleased, to say the least. He has now lost two of his sons, and they are asking him to take away his youngest. You're killing me, Smalls! Now Reuben, who is shown to be the more compassionate one in this story, actually offers to take Benjamin under his own care and pledges his own sons if anything were to happen to him. But Jacob does not take him up on his offer, and he flat out refuses to send Benjamin with them. He also makes a startling claim in his grief, which must have been pretty hurtful to them. In front of all of his other sons, he says that Benjamin is his only son left after he had lost Joseph. This not only compounds their guilt, but must instill a feeling of hopelessness as an affirmation that their father has less love for them. It is an engaging story so far, but what theological meaning can we find here? First of all, the brothers of Joseph are seen both figuratively and literally as the children of Israel. And so what happens to them theologically will be replayed numerous times throughout their history and that of their descendants. They have turned away from God and must come to terms with their transgression. They may even be cut off from God's promise for a time. Here, the land that they were promised no longer produces food. They must leave, and in doing so, they begin to realize that they must account for their crimes. They are hungry, imprisoned, and possibly worst of all, must face their father with bad news. It is only when they are faced with all of these afflictions do they begin to realize their offense against God. This sums up most of the prophetic writings, as we will come to see. The Lord is preparing them to bring them back, so that they will be able to receive the forgiveness and reconciliation. It also may be a good lesson for those of us who struggle and question the times that we encounter trials in our own life. Sometimes God allows us to struggle for a bit, so that we will seek and appreciate the redemption once we are aware of it. His brothers had to acknowledge their sin before they could be reconciled both with Joseph and with the Lord. It is not that God could not have forgiven them, but that they would not have been ready to really receive and appreciate the forgiveness that they were given and to act upon it. We also see God working through Joseph throughout the narrative. For the Israelite audience, he can be seen as a type of prophet, even a messenger of God. The Lord speaks through him, and he is in turn given the power to act on God's behalf, just as we have seen with the angels. Him acting on Pharaoh's behalf parallels this understanding, for Pharaoh was considered to be a god to the Egyptians. His life, however, does seem to foreshadow that of the prophets. As we will see, the prophets would tell the people that they had offended God and were deserving punishment, and only through repentance, atonement, and turning back to the Lord would they be able to be reconciled with God. Like the prophets, Joseph does use fear to get their attention, but he also sprinkles this with mercy. He allows all but one of the brothers to return home, and he returns their money. A common Christian interpretation of the life of Joseph sees him as a foreshadowing of Christ. The children of Israel are like humanity, who are deserving of punishment, even death. And yet, God sends his son to offer redemption. As Joseph interprets the dreams, Jesus interprets the law and the prophets, giving them a new meaning, a meaning that reveals their fulfillment. The brothers even kneel to Joseph and call him Lord. The comparison of their lives does not end with the theological meaning either. They both feed the hungry and show compassion to those who are poor. They usher in a new kingdom. And as we will see as the story continues, the brothers will be forgiven and brought into the kingdom that Joseph was instrumental in creating. Finally, how do these texts speak to the average reader in today's world? Sermons were about atonement for sin. Well, that's not the direction I was going to take, but if that's what you need to hear, it is one of the messages in the story. I was thinking rather about the example that is set by Joseph. Putting aside the prophetic or messianic archetype for a moment, let's look at him as a regular guy who is now in a position of tremendous power. Remember, he started the story as a spoiled teenager. His brothers come to him for help. His brothers, who wanted him dead, his brothers who beat him, threw him in an empty well, and sold him into slavery. 
his brothers who went home and told their father that he was dead in hopes that everyone would forget about him completely. Now they are at his doorstep looking for food. How might you react in a situation like this? You have the power to refuse them. You have the power to arrest them, even to sentence them to death, and no one would question your authority. And yet, Joseph sets into motion a plan that will lead to their reconciliation. Indeed, we might find ourselves in situations where we have power over someone else. Power differences occur for many reasons. Family relations, work positions, financial, status, language, strength, or expertise like with doctors or teachers. We all go through life with all sorts of relationships, but the question is, what do we do with the power that comes from those relationships? And with great power... If you say with great power comes great responsibility... Would I say that? But seriously though, what do we do with secrets or information that we might have about someone that could either hurt them or benefit them? We often have many different situations where we are in positions of power over someone else. Power can allow us to do all sorts of good, but can also be used to destroy. Joseph gives us an example of one who chooses to take time before making a decision that could ultimately destroy his family. He discerns and makes one comment in this chapter that really stands out, showing us his true motive behind his decisions. He says, I am a God-fearing man. I think the outcome of my decisions would be much better if I always entered into them with that statement. And one way for you to use your powers is to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and share it with your friends. You'll be thankful that you did. But thank you so much for joining me today as we have continued to explore the book of Genesis. And I hope you join me next time as the famine continues and the brothers of Joseph have to make some tough decisions. Until then, use your power wisely and do good.